Okay, this is Bill Newsom from Stanford University, and I'd like to welcome all of you from uh, to the today's panel discussion, a virtual conference on the uh, National Brain Initiative. And we have myself plus three panelists today, Terry Sanowski from the Salk Institute, Emery Brown from MIT, and Justin Sanchez, who's a program manager in the Defense Science Office at DARPA. And so we are going to each make uh, statements uh, of 10 or 12 minutes, and then we will entertain some question and answer. And I thought we'd start this off today by looking at a uh, clip of President Obama announcing the National Brain Initiative at the White House last April. Uh, many times we hear things from Washington, you know, and we think, ah, oh, another program, what are they thinking up there? But I actually think the White House got this right this time, because this is a field that's poised for revolution. And those of us who work in neuroscience understand that the field is changing extremely rapidly, right under our feet. And this is really an appropriate time for a National Brain Initiative, we believe. So let's, let's roll the clip of uh, President Obama and just let him open the proceedings here today. You know, as humans, we can identify galaxies light years away. We can study particles smaller than an atom, but we still haven't unlocked the mystery of the three pounds of matter that sits between our ears. So there, there's this enormous mystery uh, waiting to be unlocked. And the Brain Initiative will change that by giving scientists the tools they need to get a dynamic picture of the brain in action and better understand how we think and how we learn and how we remember. And that knowledge could be, will be, transformative. So I think this was an um, extremely eloquent speech. Those of you who listened to all of it, if you haven't, I'd suggest that you do so. Um, but a couple of themes came through right there that will be themes throughout our panel discussion today, uh, giving scientists the tools that they need and uh, brain dynamics, understanding the brain and action and function. And my job here as opening panelists is just to give you an overview of the NIH brain working group process. Uh, this was a committee formed uh, by Francis Collins, Corey Bargman of the Rockefeller University and I were chairs of the committee. And it was our mission to, to review the scientific evidence and what the opportunities are currently and say where we should actually uh, put our efforts as a nation in trying to unlock the mysteries of the brain. And here are quotes from our charge that was given to the committee by Francis Collins and the NIH uh, uh, leadership. And our charge said to accelerate the development and application of innovative technologies to construct a dynamic picture of brain function that integrates neural and circuit activity over time and space. So there are those two themes of technologies and dynamics coming through again. And the charge also told us to build on neuroscience, genetics, physics, engineering, informatics, nanoscience, chemistry, mathematics, to catalyze an interdisciplinary effort of unprecedented scope. So you can see that this is not a modest charge. This is actually very ambitious. And, and we were you know, properly, I think, awed by the charge in front of us. Um, we uh, decided, uh, here's, here's a map of our initial process. We decided that we did not have enough expertise on our committee to do this by ourselves. And we conducted four workshops over the spring and summer of 2013 on molecular approaches to neuroscience, human neuroscience, theory and computation and big data, large scale recording and structural biology. And we had four additional meetings over the summer. All of this culminated in an interim report to the um, advisory committee to the director of the NIH. And that interim committee, uh, that interim report then was examined by uh, people, neuroscientists and public across the nation. And in the interim report, we identified as the primary focus of the brain project, uh, a focus on circuits and networks. And basically, we decided that our central purpose was to map the circuits of the brain, measure the fluctuating patterns of electrical and chemical activity flowing within those circuits, so that's the dynamics part, and then understand how the dynamical activity in the circuits actually creates our unique cognitive and behavioral capabilities. So 
we boil this down into sort of four kinds of maps. Some of them literally maps, but one of them sort of a metaphorical map. But the very first most important is cellular maps uh, with molecular components. So this is basically an atlas of cell types in the brain. We are all um, trying to understand the cell types in the brains. This is the basic parts list, the components list that the nervous system is made of. The second type, the second kind of map is activity maps, and much has been made about the activity maps, really trying to understand the uh, display of activity in space and time as a nervous system actually functions during behavior. The third kind of map is connectivity, so this is the well-known connectome, and we can think about connectomes at local ranges and at long ranges. A fourth kind of map is a functional map. We're thinking here of perturbations in the nervous system. We've had techniques for perturbing this system for decades, but some of the most powerful ones have just come online in the last decade, like optogenetics and pharmacogenetics. And these mapping uh, neural activity on behavior, these perturbation techniques are incredibly important. But then none of the collection of data in these first four categories will be uh, understandable without conceptual maps of the brain. And for that, we need theory and computation and understanding. So we envision this as an interdisciplinary effort for discovery of fundamental circuit properties and principles, insight into circuits relevant to human brain function and importantly, disease. And we uh, envision a major outcome as being acceleration of basic science, medicine, and technology. So we have several principles that we think lie at the heart of the brain project, will lie in the heart of the brain project for the next five to 10 years. One is that no experimental systems are out of bounds. We want to use appropriate experimental systems, all kinds of animal models, and where appropriate, be able to do, uh, do experiments and get good in information in human, humans all the time, respecting appropriate ethical and clinical care standards. Another principle is to cross boundaries. We envision tool makers working together with tool users, theorists working intimately with experimentalists. It's important to integrate spatial and temporal scales and understand how spatial scales from molecules to synapses to circuits to, to networks of circuits and all the way up to behavior work together. We want to establish platforms for sharing data. We think it's a fundamental principle that all data created by the Brain Project should be public and available for other people to use and analyze that this is the way we will go forward faster. We feel like technology is not developed for its own sake, but it has to be validated in real experimental systems and then disseminated to the large community of neuroscientists or else it's just someone's private property and it doesn't do us really any good. And then a final principle, and when the, we were instructed this very carefully by the NIH director, is to consider the ethical implications of neuroscience research. After this interim report appeared in uh, September of last year, we got a lot of feedback, as you might imagine, over the succeeding months. And our very first sort of barrage of really good feedback came at the Society for Neuroscience meeting in November of 2013 in uh, San Diego. And we had several forums for feedback there. We had an open uh, Society for Neuroscience panel discussion with the leaders of several brain projects and several US agencies, including NIH, NSF, and DARPA. And we had a report from the European Commission as well. Corey Bargman and I led a town hall uh, with the scientific community where anyone could come and ask questions about brain and make comments, and deliver feedback to us. We met with the neuroscience members of the National Academy of Sciences in an all morning session and received a lot of valuable feedback there. Finally, at the end of the SFM meeting, we had a meeting of our working group where we had a one-on-one -on -one sort of discussion with the leadership of SFN and we had additional presentation of future plans by NSF, DARPA, HHMI, Allen Brain Science Institute, as well as the Kavli Foundation. And finally, we had a series of telephone conferences and one-on-one -on -one discussions with leaders of professional clinical societies during January of 2014. So the next steps of the committee, uh, the big red letter date that we have out there in front of us, and you can see I've got this in red letters on this slide, is to deliver the final report to the uh, advisory committee to the director of the NIH. And our red letter date there is June the 5th, 2014, which just happens to be my birthday. Happy birthday, Bill. Um, and, but this, this final report, as opposed to the previous, the interim report, will emphasize medium and long-term goals 
critical technologies that have to be developed. We'll also have timelines in there. We'll have cost estimates and we'll have deliverables. So we actually don't want this to be, you know, airy fairy, a bunch of scientists just kind of out doing um, their thing, whatever that might be. We really want specific goals and deliverables that people can expect out of the brain initiative. Um, and then NIH, after our final report is delivered, will hold a major stakeholder meeting, probably sometime in the fall would be my guess, to coordinate national and international efforts. So this is a question that's on many people's mind. How does BRAIN in the U.S. Re relate to the human project? What's going on in Japan? How about Israel? Uh, what's China doing? And I think NIH will be, uh, and OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology at the White House, will be trying to coordinate some of these international um, uh, partnerships. And then there are also brain initiative partners here within the uh, U.S. who will be certainly present at such a meeting. We want the NIH, all the NIH leadership to be there, representatives of the Society for Neuroscience, representatives of clinical societies, and importantly, patient advocacy organizations as well. So that is sort of a thumbnail sketch, a really quick thumbnail sketch of our process thus far. These are the members of the working group that you see in front of you now. Uh, two of the members of the NIH working group are part of our panelists today, Terry Sanowski and uh, Emery Brown. And I am now going to turn control of this over to Terry and he will be the next speaker. Uh, let's see if I can figure out exactly how to do that. Uh, So I'm having a, let's see, I'm having a problem uh, passing control, passing content control only. Is that what I want? Uh, Don, could you send me a message and uh, everything's grayed out except for pass content control only. Do I do pass content control? Terry, is your webcam connected? Okay, I'll pass to, I'm getting a message now from Emory Brown to pass to Emory. Okay, so we're gonna go to Emory Brown at MIT rather than Terry uh, Sinowski at the moment. So I'm going to bring my slides up here. Um, here we are. Great. So it's a pleasure to talk to you as part as one of the members of the, the Brain Initiative and to give you uh, some idea of like what the work is we hope to accomplish. I'm going to talk about two parts of the I'm going to talk about two parts of the um, the initiative. One is going to be about the importance of using, of developing pr proper models, statistical techniques, and data analysis approaches. And the second is going to be specifically about human experimentation and human research. So if we accomplish the goals of the BRAIN initiative, and we certainly are, con are confident that we will, then one of the things that's going to happen is just the practical reality. We're going to have a lot of data to look at. And having a lot of Generating a lot of data and not being able to turn it into information would be a huge problem if we don't address it up front. So one of the high priority areas for research that we've identified for the BRAIN initiative will be to develop methods, models, and computation that will allow us to try to get the maximal amount of information extraction from our data as it's collected. And for this, we realize that experimentalists We'll have to collaborate with um, scientists from a number of different areas, in particular statistics, physics, mathematics, and engineering, and also computer science. So one of the things that I just want to point out is what's really unique and kind of exciting about neuroscience data analysis. So here's a little schema. Like, because the brain is dynamic, understandably, neuroscience data are dynamic. And also it's multivariate and sort of multi-type. Okay? So if you look at this little scheme, we may think of ideas of how the brain works. We do experiments. And then if the experiments were just perfect, then we'd be able to just 
look at the data and see if the results agreed with the models or the abstract idea that we have. And that's often never the case, and it's going to be less and less the case as data get to be more complex. And these are some illustrations of the type of data that we're going to, to be acquiring. Neurophysiological data, functional magnetic re resonance imaging data, electroencephalography, magnetic, magnetoencephalography, cognitive responses, behavioral data, very rich array. And this is only a small subset. I'll say more about that in just a second. But the key idea is we have to think formally of how do we go back from experiments with appropriate statistical methods and computational tools and modeling to see if the ideas that we developed in our abstract models and our hypotheses and our experiments are borne out uh, for our experiments are actually borne out by the data. So this loop is an iteration which we've planned to, which ideally we should take over and over again. And by thinking very critically about the data analysis methods, we want to put ourselves in a position so that this happens as efficiently as possible. So I want to just give you a few examples. So these are, this is just a slide which is designed to illustrate just the richer array of data that are currently available in, in neuroscience. So this is just a raster plot of neurons from the, the human brain um, collected, in this case, under anesthesia. And this is an array of 129 neurons. On the left side, you see a very large pattern. Each row is the spiking activity of one neuron. And you can see what the neurons were doing. And at this point here where you see the red line, that's where the anesthetic was given. And you can see how the effect changed. What's so interesting about this is these are actual neurons from the human brain, which I'll say a little bit more about later. And we're actually seeing how they change under anesthesia. This is an illustration of functional magnetic resonance imaging. It's probably one of the workhorses, certainly for human neuroscience, and trying to figure out what's happening in the brain there. Another illustration, just simple behavioral data. The red dots are here. This is a, an animal learning a task. It's red, meaning it's getting it wrong. And all of a sudden, it starts to get it right. And the zeros, which are the red, turn into ones, which are over here blue. Another illustration is just magnetoencephalography and electroencephalography, where we make surface recordings on the scalp. And then what we try to do is infer what parts of the brain are active as a consequence. And then here, we have diffuse optical um, tomography. Diffuse optical tomography is a technique which we use to image what's actually happening inside the brain along with calcium imaging. So this is just a small subset of the types of data that are going to be produced by the Brain Initiative. And there are many, many, many more. So it's going to be very, it's very clear that one important thing that must transpire is we have to work starting now on the methods that will help us get the most information possible from these data. So I want us to say a few more, a few words about human experimentation, because ultimately, the, among other things, one of the reasons that we're studying the brain is so we can improve human health, and in particular, come up with better therapies for a wide range of um, neurological and neuropsychiatric disorders. Realizing this, we're going to be building tools, but we want to certainly build not only the tools, but the mechanisms that make it possible for us to collect human data and then also try to extract as much information as possible, all understandably with the utmost of ethical standards. And right now, there's a lot of human um, experimentation which is being done because patients are coming for therapies such as epilepsy surgery, or they're having deep brain stimulators implanted to treat um, obsessive compulsive disorders, or perhaps depression, uh, and, or to treat um, Parkinson's disease. And as a consequence, this provides a unique opportunity to, at the same time, learn about directly how the human brain functions. Having this transpire requires special teams of large numbers of individuals, multidisciplinary, neurologists, neurosurgeons, psychiatrists, psychologists, engineers, computer scientists, anesthesiologists. Because these resources are so substantial, one of the things that we want to make sure is that where it's possible that we can enable this as a consequence of the, of the work being done in the Brain Initiative. I thought I would just give you a few, maybe three examples of the sorts of things that we're able to learn or sort of see as a consequence of this type of work. So here's an illustration from some of our own research which reflects anesthesiology. And it just schematically shows you how we're able to integrate the um, findings from basic science work with 
clinical research and actually get some new insights into how the brain might work under anesthesia. This is a schema just to say we've had ideas for a number of years about how the drugs may work in different circuits. We can actually measure those in terms of EEG. This is a spectrogram from a patient who's actually under anesthesia. With the help of our modeling colleagues like Nancy Capel, we can develop models that help us understand how these oscillations may come about. And one of the signature features of being under anesthesia is having very, very profound oscillations that encompass large parts of the brain. And this is just an illustration of that, this encompassing like the, the whole front of the head when someone is in profoundly anesthetized. And it's, and it's not just in an arbitrary frequency, it's at 10 hertz. And then this is just to illustrate that here we're actually recording from patients as they've gone under anesthesia. This is a patient that is having epilepsy surgery because when they have epilepsy surgery and the electrodes are implanted to locate the focus where the epilepsy may be the source of the, the, um, the, source of the epileptic uh, seizure, they come to have that removed while they need anesthesia so we can record and see what the brain does. And it's very easy to see in this diagram that one of the things the brain does is generate the, the anesthetic induces these very, very large slow oscillations. And they actually, dis, they actually govern when the neurons can and cannot spike. So this is something we would have no way of knowing without having the good fortune of collaborating with our neurosurgical colleagues and our neuro, neurological colleagues at Mass General to allow us to do these experiments to do this sort of recording. And here are two other illustrations. This shows you human a patient having an epileptic seizure here. You can see the, the seizure activity here on EEG, and it stops abruptly. This is work which is being done by Sid Cash at Mass General Hospital. And this is just to illustrate that one of the things that they're working on is not only just recording this, but actually trying to come up with models that help us really understand this very rich and important array of data. And as a final illustration, this is very exciting work which is done by Lee Hochberg and John Donahue at Brown University. As we really come to understand the brain, perhaps one of the things that we can do, we can use it, we can help restore function to patients that have had brain injuries. And this is a lady who is quadriplegic. And one of the amazing things that Lee and John have been able to do is to capture her neural signals from her thoughts of the movement area in the brain and have her control a robotic arm. So here the robotic arm has a has a, um, a, a, um, a drinking apparatus in it. She's thinking about having the arm move over. It moves over under her control because she's thinking about it. It brings it to her. She's able to take a, dr take a drink, and then she puts it back down. So in some sense, this is kind of the ultimate, if you would, in understanding the brain, knowing how the various areas function, then being able to capture that information appropriately, effectively in real time, and then design a therapy, in this case a robotic arm, or it could be other types of therapies, which then enables this person to recover a function that she had actually lost. So these are the types of exciting things that we see as coming into the future here. And so now I'm going to pass on to my colleague, um, Terry Sanowski, and let him tell you about some of the next phases, some of the other aspects. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to welcome everybody on the webcast, and I want to uh, start with uh, the uh, the goal of the Brain Initiative, which is to develop innovative neurotechnologies. Um, and as Emery uh, pointed out, uh, these new technologies, as they come online, are going to give us unprecedented amounts of data to analyze. And I want to start out by showing you a remarkable video uh, of a larval zebrafish brain. Now, the zebrafish has a relatively small brain, about 100,000 neurons, uh, and it's transparent. And what this means is that we can use optical techniques to view activity in all of the neurons. And I'm going to show you a video of the larval zebrafish brain uh, in which uh, we, uh, a, a group uh, at Janelia Farm uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, uh, Misha Ahrens was able to record from over 80% of the neurons in the brain, that's 80,000 neurons. Uh, and this is something that neuroscientists until recently could only dream about. Uh, 
what you're going to see now is twinkling, uh, uh, and the twinkling uh, stars that you'll see are single neurons, and when they light up, uh, they're active. Uh, so if we could run that video of the zebrafish brain. Okay, uh, I think that uh, what you saw there were actually two videos, and uh, the first video was a reconstruction of a particular neuron in the hippocampus of a rat, uh, and the second video was a zebrafish, and it shows you two different scales, vastly different scales. The first one, a, a way that we can actually uh, go down uh, almost like a computational microscope and, and zoom in on single neurons and, and what's inside of them. Uh, what you saw was uh, a, a piece of a pyramidal cell. You saw synapses. Uh, but in the zebrafish brain, what you saw was something that is really quite remarkable, which is the, uh, the, the blinking on and off, uh, which is spontaneous activity. The zebrafish was immobilized. Uh, this is really quite remarkable. It's a triumph for technique. But there's a problem, which is that we don't know what we're looking at. Uh, what does all that activity mean? Uh, Let's just imagine um, what it was like to look up at the stars. We're in the same position as our ancestors many, many years ago, uh, looking up at the stars and, and wondering what was up there. What they, what they thought they saw was uh, a crystal sphere surrounding their, their uh, central location in the universe. Uh, but as you can see in this woodcut from the Middle Ages, uh, that all changed. Uh, new instruments like telescopes were invented, uh, just as today new microscopes are being uh, invented to look into brain activity. But in astronomy, the real breakthrough came when new theories were created, first by Copernicus, uh, the theory that the planets went around the sun, and second, uh, Newton's theory of gravity, uh, which allowed us to predict the orbits of the planets. What's missing from the picture today is a theory that will let us explain the meaning of all the signals that we see in the brain. Uh, the brain weighs only 2% of, of the body weight, uh, but it consumes 20% of the power. It's an enormously uh, uh, powerful computational device that we're just beginning to understand. Uh, the brain is tasked with the keeping track of all the information that uh, is coming in through our senses and to accumulate that information over a lifetime uh, and to help us survive, to find food, uh, to uh, find mates. Brain theories uh, are going to have to account for how the, all that information, how is it remembered, how is it used, how are decisions made. Now, it makes this really difficult, and, uh, and the, this slide illustrates the many levels of investigation that we can study the brain at, from the molecular at the very bottom to the entire central nervous system at the very top. We have techniques like 
brain imaging at the very top, which gives us a global picture of the brain, which unfortunately at the moment has relatively low spatial and temporal resolution, but very important for giving us an overall picture. At the bottom, we can probe the activity of single neurons. Uh, and uh, we know that, if, for example, uh, in the cortex, there's uh, 10 billion neurons. Uh, we can record from a few of them at a time, but this is just a drop in the bucket. Uh, so we clearly need to uh, improve the, uh, the number of neurons it can record from. And in the BRAIN initiative, we hope that the techniques that will become available will allow us to record from millions of neurons. Uh, and that will give us a much better picture of what's happening in particular parts of the brain. Now, another thing that is, is going to help us enormously is uh, computer models. So computers are really helping us uh, both to store data, analyze it, but also to come up with very detailed dynamical models of what's going on inside of neurons and activity patterns in networks of neurons. Uh, and this gives us new ideas. We can go back to the lab and, and test them. Uh, this will give us uh, uh, insights, perhaps, that we wouldn't have otherwise. Now, Finally, I want to show you a picture here. This is over 100 years ago. Ramon Yicajal, the great Spanish neuroanatomist, developed and used a technique called the Golgi stain that gave us a very uh, sharp picture of single neurons. And as you can see here, a pyramidal cell in the cerebral cortex has these beautiful uh, dendritic uh, arbors on which synapses are formed and uh, coming out the bottom and axon, which connects up to other neurons. Now, th this is a beautiful stain, but it gives us a misleading picture because it shows an isolated neuron. The reality is that the, all the neurons are jam-packed. And uh, what we can do now using connectomics is to be able to reconstruct the patterns of activity between all the neurons in densely packed that you saw in the first movie. Now, uh, f finally, Okay, so uh, I'd just like to thank everybody uh, for, for also attending this meeting. So I'm looking at the number of, uh, of attendees here, and uh, you know, given uh, that there are hundreds and hundreds of people online, that really uh, shows the intense interest uh, and excitement around uh, this uh, international uh, effort in brain sciences. So today I'd like to introduce uh, DARPA's perspective, and, and in particular, the science uh, perspective on brain function research uh, related to the President's Brain Initiative. Um, so from DARPA's perspective, you know, we're really trying to uh, change the way we think about science and the way that we do science related to uh, brain function research. Our efforts are extremely mission driven. We don't do science just for the sake of doing science. We do science for a purpose. Uh, we try to uh, focus our efforts such that capabilities and knowledge uh, uh, become fused together uh, in order to deliver uh, these new capabilities. If you kind of take a, a broad look of, at what's going on right now, uh, you can see that the field is changing into uh, to research that's focusing on systems of neurons uh, that is being uh, interfaced with technology. And this really opens up this new perspective of hybrid biological computational uh, approaches that can really look uh, at how um, uh, you know, the brain is processing uh, information in real time and interacting back with the, in, with the uh, environment. Now, as you heard from the previous uh, speakers, um, we're very interested in understanding the real time neural dynamics of these systems as they interface not only with the body, uh, other parts of the brain, but also back with the environment. And as we build more uh, or deeper knowledge in these areas, we really think that this is going to lead to precision therapy about dysfunction and injury of the brain. So ultimately, though, if we, um, we want to achieve uh, these high-level goals, we need to, again, change our approach to doing this. So this really means tuning into the hierarchical organization of the brain, as, as Terry uh, just stated, uh, and then uh, thinking about uh, capabilities that translate uh, local behaviors into more systems-based uh, observation of the brain. So uh, this is an area that we also feel very strongly about. Traditionally, neuroscience research is very siloed. Right? There are research laboratories uh, internationally that look at their own particular part of the brain, uh, and, and that's kind of uh, the end of the story. 
as we move to more complicated problems, we need to synergize those systems of the brain to really understand uh, this organ, right? It's unlike any other organ of the body. It's a system, it's hierarchical, and it's dynamic in nature. Uh, as we put all of those pieces together, though, uh, again, we are, DARPA is really looking at these task-oriented investments, and that could be in the areas of restoring function, exploring new mechanisms of uh, brain function, and then ultimately uh, making investments to deliver new technologies that enable us to discover new aspect of the brain. Uh, and you know, we're making investments in a lot of areas. These could be uh, prosthetic control, it could be memory, uh, it could be even neuropsychiatric relief. And I'm gonna show a few examples of that moving forward here. Uh, in terms of the mechanisms though, we're thinking about adaptation, adaptation and plasticity, learning, and even the causal relationships amongst those elements uh, in, in the hierarchy. And uh, so as, as we progress through all of this, one of our uh, you know, highest priorities is transitioning our findings uh, back to uh, injured individuals who can really benefit from the knowledge uh, such that these uh, technologies restore function and, and quality back to their life. Now, with those ideas in mind, uh, let's, uh, let me give you a few examples of how DARPA has really navigated this space thus far. And uh, the first example I'd like to just show you is in the area of motor neural interfaces or brain machine interfaces, restoring near natural, let's say, arm control back to people that have been injured. Uh, our efforts in this uh, area actually started uh, in, in the early 2000s with the brain machine interface program and, and later the hand program. And this approach uh, you know, for, for understanding the brain, you know, people back at that time were saying, you know, is it even possible to interface technology with a brain and to enable somebody to think about controlling a prosthetic device just with their own neural activity? And you know, since there was so much uncertainty at the time, uh, we got started very early in non-human primate work and, and showed that it indeed was possible. But the really exciting part about you know, getting those fundamentals uh, in primates uh, and then taking a very focused approach for doing science is that we transition that technology to humans in the revolutionizing prosthetics program. So if you look at you know, on the right side of this slide here, 2006, you know, we made our, our foray into to human work. You know, that's uh, you know, only a handful of years between the discovery of the possibilities of doing this kind of work and the actual uh, deployment of that kind of work in human subjects. So it really shows how doing very focused, focused science, uh, bringing technology and knowledge together can yield very profound changes in our understanding of the brain and very profound uh, deliverables back to society. Uh, we are continuing our mission uh, in, in these kinds of areas, but we're expanding the, the capabilities and uh, areas of brain function that we're interested in. Uh, a new program that we're uh, just getting off the ground right now is called the RAM program, Restoring Active Memory. And the vision for this program is to develop neuroprosthetics for memory recovery in human patients with brain injury or dysfunction. Uh, as many of you know, our main constituents at DARPA are military personnel that have undergone injury. And uh, many of them uh, uh, sustain traumatic brain injuries. There's been over 300,000 of those uh, in just the recent years. Um, so we're trying to develop new technologies to get these people back to a better quality of life. Now, uh, the RAM program, the way that it is structured, uh, you know, it took a few cues from that neuroprosthesis efforts uh, that, that we had very early on. Uh, we actually had a, a, a previous program called the Remind program that showed memory prosthetics in animal subjects uh, were feasible. Memory, uh, declarative kinds of memories could be uh, restored in animal subjects. And again, with that fundamental knowledge, uh, we uh, asked the question, well, can we take that knowledge and really try to transition it to humans? And that's what the RAM program is all about. Can we develop uh, neuroprosthetic technologies that can sense, that can model, and can stimulate the specific memory regions of the brain to restore declarative memory? And uh, it's extremely exciting time. There are many discoveries uh, to be had in this area, and we're really looking forward to, to getting started on that RAM program. Now, in, uh, in true DARPA uh, fashion, uh, do we just stop there with these kind of elemental aspects of, of brain function? So again, I've told you about motor control, uh, I've told you about memory restoration, but what about these more complicated aspects of brain function, the ones that uh, really are higher order uh, kinds of functions, neuropsychiatric kinds of disorders that truly 
uh, tap into these systems of neurons. And, and, you know, the kinds of functions and disorders that we're, we're thinking about now are depression, PTSD, anxiety disorder, borderline personality disorder, uh, maybe even pain or addiction, right? We know that these uh, conditions uh, affect many different sub-circuits of the brain. And uh, because we had these fundamental uh, pieces of knowledge and, and fundamental technologies to interface with the brain, we're making continued investments into more sophisticated problems. And we have a program called Subnet Systems-Based Neurotechnology for Emerging Therapy that is really gonna push upon uh, these, uh, these aspects. And the vision for this program uh, is to develop new neural interfaces to measure how systems disorders manifest in the brain and to precisely deliver therapy to humans with neuropsychiatric and neurologic diseases. And again, the, the approach is you know, very similar in, in the neuroprosthetic domain. Develop a device that can sense uh, from these sub-circuits of the brain, can model the information in those sub-circuits, and can deliver some sort of pre precise therapy uh, in a closed-loop, real-time kind of uh, fashion. Now, why are we also making this, uh, you know, this investment from a societal perspective? If you look at that statement at the bottom, 10% of the 22 million veterans uh, you know, have received treatment for mental health or substance abuse uh, issue. This is a huge problem, not only affecting military personnel, uh, but also broader uh, aspects of society. So uh, we think that we're going to have uh, great returns back in terms of the knowledge of the brain, uh, as well as the clinical therapies. Now, uh, just to take a little bit of a deeper dive into this concept, and you know, this uh, approach will dovetail very nicely uh, with what uh, Terry just mentioned. If we look at the state of the art right now in terms of uh, dealing with system-based disorders of the brain, so take, for example, a neuropsychiatric disorder, the best that your clinician or your patient can do right now is you know, potentially lay out on a couch, right, talk about your issues, and then uh, that clinician can uh, present to you uh, either a, a drug, right, so pharmacotherapy, or they can suggest some kind of surgery. But the feedback cycle uh, of this kind of interaction is very slow, if not, you know, ever, right? You, you go and you see the physician, they give you some things, and you hope for the best. We want to completely change the game on this. We want to be able to tap into multiple levels of that hierarchy, exploit really what is known about the hierarchy to deliver those precise kinds of therapies. And if we have that new interface to the brain and we can engage uh, the brain at multiple levels of abstraction in a closed loop, real-time feedback, we can do what is really shown on the right side of this slide. We can empower physicians to use knowledge-based approaches to understanding and treating the brain. Um, you know, devices of this type don't exist today. DARPA is making investments to, uh, to develop these kinds of devices. And uh, we really think that it's going to produce a new understanding and new approach for, for treating these very complex kinds of disorders. So we're extremely excited about the Subnets program and are, are poised to actually get started on that. Uh, the last kind of comments I, I'd like to share with you today to wrap up is that uh, you know, DARPA really understands and uh, is very proactive in terms of the societal implications of these new technologies and these new concepts. Um, you know, leading edge technology and uncovers these new questions, right? Ethical, legal, social, uh, you know, safety, security, policy kinds of questions. And uh, we have assembled a terrific team to, uh, to help uh, provide feedback on these issues. Uh, we really feel that it's DARPA's role and mission to uh, get into these uh, uncharted territories. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's really keeping the country uh, prepared in terms of our knowledge of brain science and what it really means for the broader aspects of society. And uh, we are engaging uh, as many people as possible to provide information uh, on all of this. Uh, and uh, again, this is an extremely exciting time uh, for brain science uh, research because we're going to learn so much about what this means uh, for the future. And uh, we're working hard at, at trying to uncover those problems. So speaking about the future, let's uh, just uh, do a, a few projections here, okay? So if we really look at today, you know, a lot of the discussion has been focused around exploring new scientific approaches with human participants. The uh, revolutionizing prosthetics, the RAM program, the subnets program, they're all really human-based. Uh, so we are going to learn a, a lot about this. We're going to be developing new tools for discovery and, uh, and, and ultimately using those tools to develop that mechanistic understanding. 
You know, I really project over the near horizon, let's say five years, uh, for example, and this is a course of, of these programs, that we will be able to provide new aspects of therapeutic relief uh, to these populations. I, I really also think we'll be able to examine how neuronal behavior can uh, direct uh, uh, and inform other uh, systems. And then uh, ultimately, uh, this information can uh, help us to uh, choose new therapeutic uh, targets for the future, deepening our understanding of brain function. Uh, in the midterm, if we're thinking uh, kind of 10 years out, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, the challenge for the, uh, the community as a whole is how to take these kinds of technologies that are affecting people with disabilities uh, and, and then, uh, you know, considering uh, the broader societal impacts, right? How can these kinds of technologies affect everyday life. I, you know, I think this is a really profound aspect of this kind of work, right? We're making huge investments in this area, but how does it really come back to the everyday person, uh, you know, on the street? You know, how does neurotechnology inform and transform our lives? Uh, so, you know, I, I, if, if I had one wish in all of this is that we can use this, um, this knowledge and this new technology to really transform uh, therapies for the broader aspects of the population's health, right? Uh, uh, moving our efforts and our, 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 our capabilities to uh, better brain health, uh, I think, uh, is going to be uh, tremendously beneficial uh, to our society as a whole. So I'm extremely excited to be a part of this, and, uh, you know, I'd like to echo um, you know, a, a lot of the, the statements that are out there, this is an all hands on deck effort uh, to make these concepts a reality. So we want to see the best ideas, the best science uh, helping to move our, our efforts forward into the future. So thank you so much. Okay, great. Uh, so thank you, Terry and uh, Emery and Justin. And we have a few minutes left now for Q&A, and uh, I've got a few questions up here that have come in. Uh, one of the ones that I would like to try to just address right off the bat um, is a question that came in, how would the brain mapping at the molecular level be translated into higher order structure and ultimately function? What would be the approaches and tools to achieve this? And I, I really want to make this point. I, I'm a kind of a systems guy myself, most of you who know me. Um, but the molecular level and genetic level is incredibly important to this entire effort. The kinds of sensors that we have um, that you saw in the zebrafish movie that are allowing us to record from thousands of neurons at a time, uh, that's all due to heavy molecular engineering to make those calcium sensors as good as possible. Our new perturbation technologies for optogenetics all comes from molecular and cellular level research. Ultimately, our access to different cell types in the brain and being able to tune and tweak circuits very specifically uh, depends on genetic access to these cell types. So, so the molecular and genetic levels underlie and are crucial to the entire brain uh, effort. Another question that has come in here that I think is on a lot of people's mind, and I'm going to ask Terry Sanowski to address this question. Uh, the question says, when it comes to data sharing and dissemination of technology, is there a plan or structure in place to allow a new technology? Uh, and I'm going to pass this to Terry and see if he can say some words about um, uh, about uh, about this technology. Although Terry, I don't actually see. I, again, we've lost full control on you. Uh, so. Maybe what we'll do is, in fact, go to a different uh, question. Um, okay, so I'm going to pass to Emery. Emery, I'm, I want to um, ask you a question about uh, what would be the crucial technologies and tools to link neural activity to cognition and behavior in humans? That's one of the questions that has come in. So I'll pass this control to Emory Barron. So thanks, Bill. I, I heard just sort of the last part of the, uh, the, the question, uh, question just because of the some audio difficulties here. But, but just speaking specifically about the types of things that we hope to see, like in the human studies, I mean, I can tell you, coming out of the work, which will, which will be de delivered by the Brain Initiative for human studies and hopefully for human health, 
I can tell you as a clinician, an anesthesiologist, um, working in an academic environment, what we think about all the time is because we're constantly taking care of patients is how can we make this better. And one of the things like in the field of anesthesiology that's going to enable anesthesiology tremendously to be a better clinical neuroscience discipline is taking advantage of the work which will come out of the initiative. Just as one illustration, right now it's almost a given that 20 to 30 percent of patients that are having anesthesia will have difficulty with cognitive function afterwards. And the likelihood of this gets to be worse once we, as we get older, and also we're very concerned about it, the effects that anesthetics might have on the developing brain in, in, in children. What this actually means is that we need new approaches. And without having a fundamental neuroscience understanding, you know, using um, animal systems and then modeling and better data analysis, we'll never get there. So this is a tremendous opportunity, I think, for, um, for, for anesthesiology in particular. But then you could replace anesthesiology with any other area, sort of disorder whether it's the neuropsychiatric or neurological disorders, as um, Justin was talking about, neurodegenerative disorders, being able to really understand how the circuits work and eventually design therapies that then control them so we can restore normal function, I think is going to be a recurrent paradigm through this initiative. And it's part of the, I think, a major part of the excitement of what we're seeing. So I'll turn control back over to Bill. Okay, thanks, uh, Emery. Appreciate that. So there are some more questions that are rolling in here. I hardly know how to uh, uh, pick them. Uh, one question is, can cognition be fully understood? Uh, that comes from uh, Mr. Kareem Heslop at Clapham University. And, you know, this is a grand challenge. This is one of the things that we all want to know. I have no idea whether cognition in the end can be fully understood. I think that many aspects of cogn cognition will be understood and many aspects of behavior will be understood. But this whole business of the human brain trying to understand itself is a grand challenge. And I certainly think there is a ton of progress that we can make. But uh, how, how far we'll get with that, how quickly, I don't know. Um, there is an interesting question here um, uh, that I'm going to ask all of the, the uh, panelists to comment on. What would be reasonable to achieve within the first five to ten years? That's a, really, that's a really interesting question about what could deliverables actually be. And, you know, for me, I would, I would pick one like I would like to have um, some some animal where all of these new techniques are integrated, where we can record from every neuron during natural behaviors, several natural behaviors for some period of time, and we know the full connectomic map of how all those neurons are connected together, and really importantly and crucially, we, can, we have a theory about how those neurons are working together to produce behavior. So I would like to, I would, my dream would be to have some success where we actually integrate connectomics and activity uh, and theory all into understanding some aspect of behavior and cognition. But I'm going to turn control over to Justin right now, uh, and I want to ask Justin how he would respond to this. What would be reasonable to achieve within the first ten, five to ten years, Justin? Uh, let's uh, pass. Okay, it looks like it's back to me. So it's and it looks like Justin had to go. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass control to Justin had to go. So there you go. Let's see. I guess I'm on the air. Um, so Bill asked, uh, what can we expect to achieve in the next uh, five years? Um, you, you know, I I think the zebrafish uh, gave us a a taste of what the future is like and I think that we should be able to understand some of the basic uh, systems if we can in the very same zebrafish if we can record all that activity and be able to work out the entire wiring diagram of the zebrafish brain that's a tall order uh, using connectomics and then uh, do that uh, 
you know, while we're studying the behavior, while the zebrafish is trying to swim, while it's uh, reacting to the sensory input, I think that uh, in five years we should be able to put together to integrate the uh, the recordings, the connections, uh, and then to create a, a very detailed understanding uh, of, of the circuits and, and model uh, the, the, the information flowing through the circuits. Okay, and I would actually like to go, um, if I can get him, I'd like to go to Emery and have Emery uh, respond to that question. So, um, again, I, because of audio difficulties, um, I, I've had difficulty hearing that just, just, just the last question. But if I think into the future, I, I think that there is a tremendous amount which is going to transpire. I, I think in the near term, we're going to learn a lot more just basic information about how various parts of the brain function at different levels. And this is just going to open up our eyes tremendously. If you think about it, um, as recently as only 20 years ago, a high fraction of neuroscience was done by recording one neuron at a time. And now we're looking at the capability of recording many neurons at the same time. What I like about the Brain Initiative is that we're going to place emphasis on not only, not only um, conducting those recordings, but also on trying to extract as much information as possible from those recordings. And as I mentioned earlier, this is going to require an interdisciplinary approach. And this, this will hopefully change the culture of neuroscience. We will really have to work in teams to, to, to sort this out. And I think that we'll see this cultural change occur as we get more and more into this process. And I think that it's going to be the sharing of information and the sharing of collaborations that is going to really enable us to accomplish the goals of developing tools that then allow us to not only understand the brain, but then as a consequence of being able to control it or repair it, make you know, the lives of, you know, of many, many um, patients, patients better. So I see this, if you want to call it this sort of change in sociology, which we're trying to foster through the initiative, as being a big thing which will come out of it. And in particular, this will be really, really key for human neuroscience, where we can't even begin to collect and study the sorts of information that we need if we don't operate in teams. So I'll pass control back to um, back to our moderator, Bill. So I would I would add another thing that it should be very achievable in the next five years that we ought to be see extensive. Um, atlases of cell types uh, and extensive atlases of at least medium scale connections in a variety of brains. So cell types is really important. This is, this is something that it's, it's the parts list of the brain. We know that there are over 50 cell types in the retina. Getting ac genetic access to the various cell types and actually being able to uh, manipulate them independently of each other is critical and this is a thing where I think the technology exists right now and putting an atlas of cell types in front of people and giving people tools to access different cell types this is going to benefit not only the brain initiative but it's going to benefit uh, clinical research it's going to benefit anyone who does any kind of research on the nervous system and I, I think that's something that's definitely achievable starting in animals but moving into humans over the next five to ten years something that I think we can all really look forward to um, there's a um, there's a interesting there's several interesting questions here um, are there any initiatives to address the problem of Alzheimer's and memory loss and this is something that's on a lot of our minds. It's on my mind. I'm age 62. This is not a trivial question to me. And I, I think that the brain initiative itself is not specifically disease related, but it's important to know that we are trying to put in place tools that will help us address all diseases like Alzheimer's and memory loss. It's also important to realize that the brain initiative is spending about $100 million in the first year 
And this compares to a total of 5.2 billion of NIH spending alone on neurobiologically related problems and including a very large chunk of money on uh, programs directly related to Alzheimer's and memory loss. And what we want brain to do is act like an amplifier, put critical technologies in place and critical new information in place about the basic function of the brain that will then amplify that entire $5 billion investment and make that $5 billion worth a lot more because the scientists who are at work on the problems of Alzheimer's and memory loss have more tools at their disposal. Um, there's another interesting question here. Um, uh, what mechanisms exist for older established investigators in other areas to join the initiative? Um, and I will try to pass control over to, I'll see if I can pass control over to Terry Sanowski if he's still here. I know that the group that he was part of cares a lot about attracting uh, established investigators. Well, it looks like Terry's off the air again. Um, so I'll just, I'll just try to answer that. One, one of the uh, insights of the Brain Committee, or one of the things that the Brain Committee feels very, very strongly about is that uh, as Justin Sanchez said, this is an all hands on deck effort. And we really need people in here from all fields. The brain is no longer just a problem in biology, if it ever was. It is now a problem in theory. It's a problem in computation. It's a problem in data handling. It's a problem in chemistry. Uh, and it's a problem in psychology. And we have got to have people uh, from all of those fields in. So there will be mechanisms, especially we need people to come in from statistics uh, because we are having these large data streams that we just don't understand very well yet. So we need people, new people, new talent from statistics and new people and new talent from theory and computation to help us understand the data. And I think that there will be routes that uh, people, we, we need people from electrical engineering who can help us do uh, better signal processing and build us better devices to get uh, microscopic and, and microscale and nanoscale devices into the brain and communicate them with them wirelessly so that the current systems we have, which seem so cumbersome, can be improved and get to next generation. So there, there will be lots of opportunities, I think, for uh, people to, for people to uh, work on this. I'll see that Terry's back on. Terry, there's a question here about, um, about data sharing and uh, if there are actual initiatives going on to make data available and what we think about data sharing. And I'm going to pass for the sharing. And I'm going to... Yes. Uh, one of the uh, challenges that we have uh, right now is uh, not a technical one, it's a sociological one. The way that experiments are done in labs is that um, data are collected typically by uh, students and postdocs. And then the data are analyzed, and then papers are written, and then the data languishes uh, on a computer, uh, and, and it never sees the light of day. Um, we, uh, in the Brain Initiative, uh, there's going to be an effort to uh, make the data available uh, to uh, other scientists. That is to say, part of the uh, infrastructure that will be developed uh, will be a central file server that will allow uh, neuroscientists and others to uh, pass their data on. And uh, this is very important uh, because new analytic techniques are being developed every day for analyzing data. And that will allow us to reanalyze old data and compare it to new data coming in. In the same way, for example, that astronomers have access to archival data from the Hubble Space Telescope, which are being used to uh, probe the, 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 the very early stages of uh, the universe after the Big Bang. And uh, this is uh, something that is going to uh, take uh, some effort by neuroscientists to change habits. Uh, it's, it's something, though, that will, I think, have a huge impact uh, on the future of the field in the same way that, for example, having genomics databases has really had a big impact on molecular genetics. I'll pass now back to uh, Bill. Okay, so we are now over our allotted hour slightly, and we will draw this to a close. Uh, we have a lot of other good questions that could be here. 
uh, and B, answered and lead to lots of fruitful discussion. Uh, but I want to thank all of the listeners and viewers for being with us today. And I hope we've at least given you a little taste of the Brain Initiative and uh, what it is at the moment and what it can be for the nation in the future. And I would just like to say, um, you know, I, again, what I started with is that I think the country has a really unusual opportunity. I think that this is an area of science due to the new technologies that have come online that's poised for just extraordinarily rapid growth and has extraordinary promise for helping us understand, as President Obama said, who we are as humans and for helping us to address uh, a lot of really insidious neurological diseases. And I think this will have an economic benefit. I think that uh, it, an entire companies and economy will grow up around uh, the new discoveries that are going to come out of brain science and that those companies and those jobs are going to be in places where the discoveries are being made. And it's a critically important time for the United States to make a commitment that we are going to be the place where these discoveries are, are made. So um, for all of you listening, no matter what field you're in, there's a place for you here. And for you young people especially, this is a great way, I think, to, to spend a career. So we'll sign off now, and thank you so much for listening. Goodbye.